Um, starting off will, is Dr. Susan schmidt Lochner. She is a child psychiatrist who specializes in autism and developmental disabilities. She also happens to be the medical director at Vista Del Mar. Uh, next to her is Pat Grayson Dijon, who is a parent, a retired special ed administrator working with LA, working, worked with LAUSD, a consultant and an education advocate. Next to her, we have Sorrel Markowitz, who is an autism specialist with Westside Regional Center. <laughs> then we have Lori Stevens, uh, who is a consultant and clinical director of clinical services for education spectrum disorder. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> education spectrum, which provides services to children with autism spectrum disorders. And then we have Mary Pizan. Um, you've heard this morning and this afternoon. So Susan? Anyway, I have been seeing kids with autism since I was a baby in 1984. And really, I was a baby back then because I've learned so much in the ensuing years. And my most valuable teachers have been the kids that I see and their families. And one mom told me quite some time ago, Dr. Sue, you know, if you've seen one kid with autism, you've seen one kid with autism. And we've heard this repeated today, but it is so true. There are no cookie cutter templated prescriptions for kids with autism, not for biomedical interventions, not for psychosocial, not for educational interventions. Every child with autism is an individual and everyone needs his very own unique treatment plan. And it's also very important to not lose sight of our long-term goals, which we've spoken about previously. And what are our long-term goals? It's um, to improve the quality of life for people with autism. And how do we define quality of life? This is the ability to learn, to play, to have fun, to work with family, friends, and co-workers. And I'm reminded um, of a family that many years ago asked me to visit their teenage boy in a group home up in the Santa Barbara area. And this daddy had one dream for his son, Joey. He wanted Joey to talk. And that was the reason he was consulting with me. So I went up and I followed Joey for a day. And Joey went to school, in a high school. And um, he had a very basic augmentative technology device. It was like a go talk for. His communication was very, very limited. And he had a vocational component, which actually was pretty revolutionary. Joey went to a restaurant, and he fed potatoes into a machine to make french fries. And he did it carefully and methodically. He dropped the potato, washed it, put it in the machine. And he did this with endless patience for about an hour. And then he came and sat down at the counter with a huge smile and they brought out this huge plate of french fries and I said, oh gosh, this is definitely, it's got to be stopped. And then I saw Joey savor those french fries and I've never seen a kid savor french fries like that. Amazing. And then I followed Joey back to the group home which I was ready to move into. It was nestled in the hills of Santa Barbara. And the kids were in the pool, and Joey was jumping up and down, self-stimming in the water. And I called to him several times, and he didn't answer me. And at one point, he turned around, and he um, made eye contact with me. He came over to me, and he had this huge smile on his face, and he splashed me. And that was sort of an epiphany moment for me, because I realized that Joey was never going to talk, but that Joey was a very happy young man. And so it's very difficult when we're talking about our kids because we want them to be the best they can be. We want them to really be, meet their potential. But at the same time, we have to have realistic expectations and realistic outcomes. Okay, so when we're looking at treatments with autism, we have to realize nothing works for everybody. We have to do assessments and we also have to have tools that can, um, assessment procedures. So if we're 
doing um, behavioral plans, we have to have very specific goals. If we're doing medication, we have to have target behaviors, we have to have rating skills, we have to really be able to have assessment um, procedures. And um, we also want to realize that these are not moral ethical issues. I have many parents who come to me and they say they feel like they're criminals because they haven't put their kid on a gluten-free, casein-free diet. And it's true that the gluten-free, casein-free diet does help certain kids who have gut-brain connections. But it isn't for everybody and we have to figure out what is for a particular child. And we also um, have to understand that most of these new treatments have not been validated scientifically. We have to be very, very careful because unfortunately autism has become a business and every day there is a cure du jour and um, Connie and Harvey can remember um, in the 70s, I believe it was, everybody was going on on fenfluramine and this was a stimulant and fenfluramine was going to improve your IQ, it was going to improve your language, your social relatedness and what happened? Kids got stuck on fenfluramine for years and in the 90s, what did we see? We had a um, class action suit for um, irreversible nerve damage. Another one, I don't know how many of you remember, the secretin run. Secretin um, was a hormone from the pig pancreas that if you IV injected your child with autism, he was going to have a dramatic um, improvement. And people were running to pharmacies paying the price of gold for secretin. Pharmacies were out and then they were IV injecting their kids and exposing them to potentially very dangerous situations because um, you could develop human antibody to the um, pig um, substance. And lo and behold, when the National Institute of Health did double-blind placebo-controlled studies, secretin was no better than placebo. So we have to be very, very careful. We have to ask ourselves some questions. Will the um, treatment result in harm to the child? Is it a developmentally appropriate treatment? I had a very sophisticated, well-to-do family from the Palos Verdes area, and they took their kid down south somewhere for rebirthing, and they put this kid in a dark room with no sensory input for nine months. Now, needless to say, that kid regressed, and the cost to the family, the other kids were left with a nanny, you know, in their estate. But people can make wrong decisions. Look, everybody's looking for a cure. So we want to ask ourselves, has the treatment been validated scientifically? Not all treatments have been validated scientifically. The diet, the gluten-free, casein-free diet, which is the rage, there has only been one study, double-blind, out of England, which says the diet is no better than placebo. About 70 kids um, placebo control were in the study. But still, the diet is not going to harm you. I mean, it's problematic. You've got picky eaters who are going to be on restricted diets. But the diet is not going to kill you. So um, it. If you want to try the diet and get it out of your system, that's fine. But we have to make very, very careful choices. And we also don't want to be get so infatuated with any treatment modality um, that we forget about other things that are important, such as um, functional curriculum, vocational life, and social skills goals are ignored. I have parents who become neurofeedback junkies, or who become now they become hyperbaric oxygen therapy junkies, and I say, hey, that's well and good, it may not be harming your child, but your child is eight years old and not potty trained, so let's refocus. So I want to say just a word about medications because that's a whole day in and of itself. Um, we have to be aware, we have to be very careful because medications are treating symptoms. And the medications that we are using in autism were developed primarily to treat other disorders and then they were tried on our guinea pig kids because of an overlap in certain symptoms. So we have to be very, very careful and we have to establish target symptoms. And it's true, our kids have symptoms that do get in the way. Hyperactivity, short attention span, impulsivity, distractibility, the stereotyped motor um, movements, the self-stimulatory behaviors, the hand flapping, the jumping, the twirling. 
I see a lot of kids with self-injurious behaviors, head banging, biting themselves, putting their heads through windows. So self-injury is a real problem, as is aggression. We have social withdrawal, we have anxiety, most of our kids don't do well with transitions, with new people, new places. And a biggie is sleep disturbance, because um, if your kid isn't sleeping, you can have a nervous breakdown as a caretaker. So that's an important one. So we want to target symptoms, and these are all the different medications that we have um, to target symptoms. But I want you to know that our kids in the spectrum really are more sensitive. They have what we call paradoxical responses. So they have more side effects, much higher side effect profiles. Now, all of, most of our kids are inattentive and distractible. If you take a stimulant and treat a kid with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, 98% of those kids are gonna respond. What happens when you treat a child with autism with um, stimulants? 40% will respond, and the other 60% are gonna go bonkers, they're gonna get irritable and agitated. So our kids respond differently to medications, and we have to be very, very, very careful with medications. Adolescence is a um, very tough time for kids. Half of them are gonna have an exacerbation. I have a lot of calls from 11-year-old, parents of 11-year-olds, because your kid can be smooth sailing and suddenly a year prior or um, after the onset of adolescence, we've got a lot of um, problems. Um, we wanna make sure that the target settings, the target behaviors are present in more than one setting. Okay, I'm going to just say a word about um, nutritional supplements. They need to be done under supervision as well. I have most of my kids on omega-3 fish oil. It helps with brain development, with language. Um, but I've had kids who have started ticking on fish oil. Is there a gut-brain connection? In some, for some kids, definitely. Are there kids with leaky gut who cannot process gluten and casein? Some kids, definitely, but it's a minority of kids. There are some things that we can do um, for all kids. They can be on colostrum, which is nature's first food. Um, it's before breast milk comes in, very high in immunoglobulins, and also probiotics is good for everybody, everybody in the room. Um, good gut bacteria um, that uh, lactobacillus, and you can um, control overgrowth of yeast and virus. Um, so again, there are kids with um, true tummy problems, gut um, brain reactions, and we do have to look into that. We can try the diet. How are we gonna try the diet? We're gonna go off all casein, all milk-related products for three weeks, and we're gonna go off all gluten products for three months. This can be very problematic because our kids are already very picky eaters with limited food repertoire. But in three months, you can get it out of your system and know if your kid is gonna respond to the gluten-free, casein-free diet. Our kids have poor nutritional profiles. You can often see that from looking at them. They're, you know, they just look tired. And they, um, their vision is poor. They've got a lot of cavities. And when we look at their blood work, their nutritional status is compromised. And we do know, do know that there is immune dysregulation with our kids in autism. When we look again at their blood work, um, they are about a third of them have autoimmune dysfunction, a third to two thirds actually. Okay, there are a bunch of immune boosters or supporters you can use under the direction of your doc. And sleep disorders, our kids are notoriously terrible sleepers. They can um, wake up in the middle of the night, they can be singing for two hours a night, they can, you know, I had um, a kid who in the middle of the night left his house and got in through the neighbor's dog door. So our kids are very creative. Um, but the bottom line is if your kid is not sleeping and you're up all night, you're a wreck and your kid isn't functioning. So it's very important, it's a really important target for parents to get their kids um, sleeping. And there are some dietary supplements as well as behavioral interventions we can use, magnesium melatonin, a half milligram up to six milligrams, taurine, GABA, L-tryptophan. 
And I just want to end by saying that whatever we're doing, whether it's a medication or a vitamin supplement, we need to see a robust response. It's not just, well, maybe this is helping my kid. We need to see a real robust response to continue. And we need to be very, very careful because um, we're the guardians of um, our children's bodies and souls, so we have to make very informed decisions and we need to become informed consumers.